Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today I'm with a manager. She manages um, Django and All Day Trey, to my knowledge, at least. Maybe she manages <laughs> more, <laughs> but does she get her hands in like everything, honestly, Seattle and Spokane. So I'm excited to learn more about her background and see what um, advice we can give to up and coming artists and creatives. It's my pleasure to introduce Riker. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> what an intro. Yeah. Um, is, yeah. You, do you just manage Django and uh, All Day Trey, or is there anyone else? In no, the I, uh, I was going to say, you're about to learn today. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I got, a, I got a couple more on my roster. I also manage uh, an artist named Death Star. Um, he happens to DJ for Django, but he's also a producer and an artist uh, all in himself. Um, he makes, like... I mean, he's a variety, actually. Super talented, super musically talented. Um, from but, Spokane? Or? Uh, yeah, well, actually, from Canada. Oh, hey. hey. Yeah. He's Canadian. He's a dual citizen. Okay. Um, but um, he does, uh, you know, electronic music, uh, has a core base in hip hop, um, did some stuff in rock. So, it really just super all format, super versatile. So, he. He's he's awesome. Um, and then I also have a cannabis personality mm. named Young Crown. Um, What's a cannabis personality? <laughs> it's just like um, I mean, it's a personality that identifies himself in the you know the space of cannabis. He mm. uh, hosts a lot of events. He um, kind of has a, a huge social presence in in that uh, industry. It goes to um, a lot of like. He gets invited to like a lot of like private sessions and like just different things in that culture. Um, I happen to own some cannabis brands as well, so y'all might find Ooh. out about that today. Hell yeah! Um, so he kind of is attached onto that side of my world. Um, but uh, right now he's kind of making um, some cool brand adjustments, so he's uh, he's he's quiet. So I, I can't see. wait to to roll his stuff back out and uh, show y'all what we've been working on. So Hell yeah. So yeah. let's learn a little bit about your background. Are you originally from Spokane? Or? I am. I am. Uh, born and raised is, I probably could call it that. Okay. Uh, I did a lot of traveling as a child, which is probably why I enjoy traveling so much now. Um, but uh, my, my parents, uh, my father, uh, Actually, both of them have a sports background. Um, and my dad, uh, I don't want to get too detailed in it, but um, he played college ball. It was really good. Could have gone NBA if he really wanted. He had a lot of offers. Mm. Um, but he decided to put together, um, I, I guess he ran, like, the largest basketball camp in the world um, with uh, a man named Fred Kroll, who just passed away, actually. So From COVID? Rest in, or? Rest in peace. Um, no, he, he had been sick for a while. I'm sorry um, to hear that. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, you know, that, that just took place. But outside of that, um, I actually grew up in a pretty strict sports household. So, so you yeah, did sports? I did. I did a lot of sports. Um, basketball, I had some D1 offers as well. Ooh, wait, how tall are you? Uh, not that tall, but my license says I'm like 5'6", so we're going to hey. go with that. Wait, does, does <laughs> height for women's basketball not matter as much as guys or? um it matters okay. um but i think that the average you know it, at least especially before college um the average ball player is probably like i don't know five six five seven maybe mm. maybe maybe five eight um i was really strong so okay. i was able to move i usually was like a two or a three um so i was off ball um, pretty decent shooter because I grew up in a sports household and yeah. instead of getting grounded I usually ran lines you oh, know shit. that type of life <laughs> so um, I was I was quick uh, I was strong uh, that really I think set me apart uh, in the sports world with girls was that I was a lot stronger than people and um, I just had a different type of mindset that most women tend to not carry mm. um, I was very dedicated and determined the dedication women carry for sure but um, I think I had a level of like, I don't want to call it aggression, but, uh, I spent a lot of time with men. So like, do you have siblings? Uh, I do. Yeah, oh. I do. I have an older brother and an older sister, oh, but shit. they're very, uh, into like literature and like education. Um, very, very book smart. I was, uh, much, much more on the other side. <laughs> How would you describe yourself now? Do you think you're book smart? I feel like you have to be somewhat book smart to be like a manager, right? I would say a little book smart. I would say a little book smart, but I know some people that are like super book smart. So it's hard for me to 
you know, put myself in that category. I would say I'm really good. Um, I'm just really good in person. I'm really good reading a room. I'm mm-hmm. really good understanding co- how to communicate. So I'm I'm definitely more of like a, a hands-on um, type of approach instead of, you know, sitting back with... Uh, I'm very analytical. I will say that. I don't. I wouldn't say I'm book smart, but I I definitely am gonna read a situation. Is that something like people were born with, or is that something you learned from like family upbringing? Or I think that's something that I've always had, but I definitely had to develop it and like finesse it and get it to where it is. You know, it, it wasn't something I just like woke up with, but um, I spent a lot of time around people as a kid. I met, I don't know, 2,500 people a year probably or more. (laughs) With sports or what? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I went to Europe before I was 18 for sports and, like, yeah, traveled, did a little basketball tour. I was, like, actually 13. (laughs) So, I was before I was even 16. But, yeah, I, uh, I had gone to Europe twice before I was 18. And so, I, I went to over half of the United States for basketball um you know we ran camps at each camp there's 400 kids i'm doing nine camps a summer damn so like i constantly was meeting new people so i realized when i got older that one thing that separates me from a lot of other individuals is that i'm not afraid to talk to people and i didn't even really understand that that was like a thing that people like have a fear Mm. of interacting with people they don't know do you know stage fright is like the number one fear yeah that's wild it's (laughs) i don't i wouldn't say i don't have stage fright like if if I had to be on a podium in front of probably 500 or more people, yeah, I'm going to get a little bit of stage fright. But, like, as far as interacting with people not on a stage, I have, like, I mean, I could start a conversation with anybody. We could literally go outside the studio and you could pick somebody and I could easily <laughs> start a conversation. Yeah. And I, I think that that is a skill that I have learned is special to me. Mm. Um, and so I, I've developed that. I think I've developed my personal skills. I don't know if I was that personal as a kid, but um, I think you learn. Learning is really important to me, I think. So, and like growing. And I think you grow through meeting people. You know, like if you're just Very like much. in a box your entire life. I mean, I think even like living in Spokane, it's an obvious example of that, right? Like, um, shout out my city. I love my city in a lot of ways, but most of the people there haven't left. Spokane and yeah. Coeur d'Alene and or Washington ever and so it's like you know just even with the diversity element you've never been around more than like 5% black people yeah right? Spokane has like no black people right <laughs> so like if you go to you know I've been to East Coast multiple 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 times Atlanta is one of my favorite cities mm. so like I know what it's like to be in a room that is all white and I'm the only person of color or black person but I also know the exact opposite where I'm in a room full of people of color and I have, you know, my one or two white friends with me. Do you think, like, race plays a part in interaction with people? Absolutely. Because I think that race plays a part in how you were raised. And I think race plays a part in the way society treats you. And I think race plays a part in how each and every interaction transpires to some degree. And so sometimes it's, you know, a heavy aspect of it. Sometimes it's extremely minimal. But to some degree, I think that um, that there's always going to be a race element, especially in America. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, people of color like us, we, we learn code switching, you know, and we yeah. learn uh, certain things that I think kids in the burbs don't necessarily have to know. Yeah. I was a. Uh Talking, we were talking about Ellis Prescott before. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I don't know why. I rem- this is like the most memorable part of the interview for some reason for me. I was like making a joke when we first started with when, when I interviewed him that we both have good resume names, like <laughs> Ellis and Blake. But then I... <laughs> <laughs> but then I oh, I was thinking... I've been thinking about that a lot recently. I'm like, but then I... On a resume or an application, you, you put down your race. So I wonder how much that even plays into a resume. That's kind of weird that you actually do have to put down your race on it. They categorize you? I guess so, huh? I mean, I also think it's interesting they 
gender, you know? Yeah. Um, being female, I think that I have a lot of male friends. The majority of my group is male. Um, and I think that sometimes they live, they're also of color, a lot of them, and they live in a cross world of being, you know, a black person in America. So they understand what that challenge or struggle is like. But a lot of them are men. Mm. So they don't understand the next step of what it's like to be female and black in America or just being female in America. Yeah. And then, you know, we could even go a half step more and talk about being queer. And I think that all of those things kind of play. Wasn't queer, didn't that used to be like a, like a slur? I think queer was a slur like the N-word was a slur. You know what I'm saying? So you're like taking it back kind of? or To some degree. I like to use the word queer because it is an umbrella in which describes or embodies uh, a, a wide variety of things. Mm. And so I don't like to assume people are gay or lesbian or bisexual or pansexual or omnisexual i don't want to assume oh shit what's omnisexual uh pansexual and omnisexual are very similar the difference is that with pansexual um the gender of the other person is not of relevance mm. or is not necessarily recognized um where with omnisexual um they are going to identify and or recognize that like this person is male and this person is female and or this person is transgender and like appreciating both the gender aspect as well as uh, not having a barrier of what the gender is mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense what do you think about people who don't want to be like a person they want to be like a toaster or something like, what do you what do you think about that <laughs> uh, i think you're putting me on the spot <laughs> <laughs> i think for the most part i think people should be able to do and be whatever they want yeah. i don't think that that affects other people and i think <laughs> other people get offended by stuff that has nothing to do with them a lot of the time so yeah. Do what makes you happy. I don't know about a toaster, but, <laughs> <laughs> but do what makes you happy. <laughs> I think we'll live in eventually like in a total recall. Well, when you think of total recall, it's kind of a dystopian world, but also at the same time, like in those movies or Star Wars, like you're mm -hmm. like an alien, you could have like a million arms or eyes, and like no one really looks at that. So that would be cool if hopefully in the future we get to that. I mean, that point. I don't know if this is where I should just start talking about my my thoughts but i i think i think we're egotistical to think we're the only thing here yeah as like humans like that's just like us to yeah. think that we're like the only thing on the planet or the only thing in this universe i think that it's pretty obvious that we're probably not alone and they may be among us right now who knows i'm excited lizard people They're i'm here excited right. <laughs> i just i just i think the next like steps of where this world could go is gonna be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's you know I'm a vegan, so that comes with the uh, understanding and belief in things like you know global warming and or <laughs> you know what's wait what's global warming? Okay, so yeah, you have <laughs> global warming and then you have climate change. Um, I think that you know we're dealing with both. Um, but yeah. I think climate change is like really, really amongst us right here, right now. Did you know like a ton of fish died during that heat wave? Mm -hmm. Isn't that like no one talked about it? There's like thousands of fish fucking. No, the got vegans boiled. talked about it. Okay. <laughs> we talked about it. <laughs> and I think that um, I think that we're just burning through resources, and I think that we're doing what we every movie that we watched <laughs> growing up, and uh, you know, it's probably not going to end in a pretty way. But I think that we are going to experience things that this world's never experienced and that alone is you know kind of cool to be a part of history to some degree cool just relatively. goes downhill from here right <laughs> yeah i uh i was just talking to somebody yesterday and i was like you know it's really unfortunate that we we've had this pandemic and a lot of this has been really hard and um you know I, there are so many people that have lost lives lost family members um and I think all of that is is needs to be recognized first and foremost, and that is definitely sad. But I think what also is really interesting is like, we are currently living through a pandemic. Yeah. You know, like they will always talk about this moment. Like, we are here through something that hundreds of years before us never ever ever experienced. So this is just the start. What if this is like 
we, I feel like a lot of people talk about like when we're out of this, you know. Yeah. But like, what if what if it's more like <laughs> the start in twenty twenty? This is when the apocalypse started, and then we're in twenty forty, and now we have COVID twenty thirty and yeah, whatever things in the fucking ice cape. What are they? The ice caps, you know? I don't know, <laughs> man. I don't know. I I just am here for the ride at this point. <laughs> yeah, I just do my part. I try and recycle. I try to, even though. What about compost? Do you have a compost? Oh, I do. Oh, I do. yeah. You're the, a good person. You know, <laughs> you know, the recycling hardly does anything. Like really? Yeah, they. I mean, we like to think it is, and the marketing of it likes us to think that it is. But in all reality, when it goes all the way down the chain, they're not recycling like the majority of the stuff that we're sending them. Yeah. So it's awful, but you got to do what you can. Try to just eat healthy. No more meat consumption, mm. you know. No more dairy consumption. And when when I think of recycling, for re- for some reason the first like thought that pops in my head was like in elementary school, and there was this phase of pencil pouches that were made out of Capri Suns, <laughs> and I was like, damn, we're living in the future. We got comp- uh, we got recycled Capri Sun pencil pouches. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that's <laughs> hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> But yeah, I, I I don't know if I think about um, the end of days really, but I'm yeah. happy I'm happy to be alive and talk to people like you, you know. I think that I think people don't want to look past today, you know. Yeah. And I don't got kids. Do you want kids eventually? We'll see how this all goes. I don't know. Yeah. I think my life right now is so demanding. It's it's really hard to think through that lens. Mm-hmm. Um, perks of being queer i get to choose my moment you know Mm. so i uh i don't know if that's gonna come i i'm not opposed to the idea but i also don't know how i feel about bringing children into this world what about adopting is that maybe is that more like of a good deed fun fact i'm adopted oh so it's actually super high on my list if i have a kid i will be adopting a kid so i will for sure if i have one i'm having two do you do you have a DNA in me to know what you're mixed with and everything? Um, I don't think we got time to go into why <laughs> I don't like DNA in me. <laughs> but um, the government, they're yeah. tracking us. <laughs> um, also, I think you know when you're a black person, like, yeah, you're not getting like, they're not doing the breakdown the way that we don't have a history. Like they wiped it all out, so it's like mm. a lot of that isn't there. Um, but no. Um, I haven't. And I actually, my parents are so great. My uh, my dad and my mom had gotten some of the, like, uh, court paperwork. So I have, like, a whole, like, file that I can, like, read. A lot of it is, like, X'd out and stuff. But there's a lot of information that I was able to get about, um, you know, my family, where I come from, like, all that. Yeah. Um, and then my parents actually hired a PI for a long time and uh, found uh, the location or the city uh, where my birth mom is. Holy shit. And then uh, I kind of just, after that, I just kind of pulled the plug and was like, I think that's good. Mm. But I don't I don't know if I want to open that door. Yeah. You know? I think Not melanin sure is that. really weird. Like, I'm actually, I'm mixed, but I'm actually, I know a lot of guys or women or whoever who are, have like two black parents and somehow I'm darker than them. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's craziness. Melanin is really interesting. I um, It's a fun word too. Black people are awesome. Yeah. I mean, all people are awesome, <laughs> but uh, our culture is great and we're resilient and even down to our skin and the way we adapt. Yeah. You know, I wonder if white people are like, Oh, I know. Oh. I, all people, all people are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, t- so did you go to college or? Nope. Self-taught. Ooh. So, how did you uh, get into artist management? All right. Here's the here's the background story. Here we go. Um. So, once upon a time, I was into a girl. Okay. <laughs> and that girl moved to Arizona, and she was a musician. And at the time, I was just kind of sick of Washington. It wasn't all that I knew from a sense of, like, I did a lot of traveling. But it was all that I knew from a sense of, like, long-term living. Mm -hmm. And I wanted change. I just wanted something different. And I don't love the cold at all. So, um, like, I'm here for snow every so often. You know, I'm here for a little bit of 
nice Seattle rainy afternoon, but like yeah. 300 days out of the year of like fairly cold. Okay, it's not that much, but it, it's pretty high up there. It's cold. And we always forget. Like summer comes around and everyone forgets that we're living in Seattle for a few months. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it is beautiful. But I wanted well, some different, different climate. So mm. let's go down to Arizona. Um, uh, spend time with this girl um, and I'm basically just like helping um, where I can with her music right and rewind rewind I had mentioned my dad was a basketball coach mm-hmm. grew up in a coach household okay fast forward <laughs> um, you'll have to do that <laughs> um, so you know I'm hanging out with this girl and I'm just like at concerts like helping her you know set a merch table and like helping her put her social media together and like doing all this and um i was at a show one time and the production manager was like at the time i did not know that was who it was but production manager is like um hey you know you're with the artist you're with the band and i'm like yeah yeah you know and they're like cool like what's your title what do you do and i was like i don't nothing i just you know i'm just helping blah blah and he was like oh okay like what do you do for the band and i was like this and this and like you know help organize that and blah blah and he was like oh so you're like the manager and I was like, what's a manager? <laughs> and so, like, I go back that night and I start researching, like, what an artist manager is. And then I realize, holy shit. Wait, I'm allowed to swear, right? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Holy shit. I'm a manager. I should put that on a tips, on my directions and tips PDF. Like, swearing is allowed. <laughs> You're allowed to drop F bombs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I. Uh, uh, it was really cool. I just started to like identify who I was in a moment I was already living in. Damn. Um, and so me and the girl didn't really work out. Um, in which I, way? Like, were you in a relationship at one point? We we were in a relationship, which is why oh. we didn't work out because you can't be. I don't want to say you can't. All right. Probably shouldn't be in a relationship <laughs> with your artist. <laughs> Like ninety nine point nine percent of those situations shouldn't happen. Yeah. If you Lorelai and Moses do it, but they're not. I was gonna say if you've been in a relationship, and then you guys like agree to go into that space, understanding how this all works. Like mm. there are certain circumstances. There's definitely some people that are mature enough and can compartmentalize and do that. Mm-hmm. Most people shouldn't do it. Right. <laughs> so, as a first time manager and as a first time artist with a manager, obviously that did no, that did not work. Right. Um, great human, love the human. If you're watching this, I still have love for you. Shout out to that human. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, anyway, uh, I come back to home and I realize like I need to go to my roots. I need to go to my support system. Africa. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> Uh man, I always want to go to Africa. Like, like Dave Chappelle, you know, just <laughs> leave and find yourself. In I would Africa. love to go to Africa. That would be awesome. Hell yeah. Um, sorry, I have to hit this. Shout out, <laughs> vitamin water. Hit out vitamin water. Our non-official sponsor. <laughs> oh, you can send me packs of zero sugar vitamin Ooh. water, please, anytime. You should get your Jang water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got that. I got the, the <laughs> jang water down here. <laughs> so, um, so you go find your, your roots. Find my roots. Uh, I go back to Spokane. You know, I, I kind of get dialed back into to my support system. And um, I found a rock band. Oh. And I started managing them. And within probably a few weeks, but it took about a month or so to get through the process, I realized I did not like managing bands. Too many people? Too many people. It is way too many ideas and minds going in way too many directions. There's rarely a leader. It's very hard to conduct business because everybody has their own opinion about how that should work. Mm -hmm. And when I was as green and new as I was, it just wasn't a good fit. I think that if a manager is established and able to bring a certain level of like, uh, I've done this before um, history experience to the table um, then you'll be able to have a different relationship with the band um, but for me it just was not a great fit mm. so uh, I went away from that and I found a hip hop artist not Django not Django okay. not Django yet <laughs> no uh, I think we're in like 2015 like right now okay 
Um, so yeah, it's so all started in like 2000 and let's call it 13, 2013. Okay. Yeah. Um, unofficial start okay. in 2013. So on Wikipedia, we'll, we'll have to work <laughs> on that. <laughs> oh, and so yeah, uh, fast forward, I, I have a hip hop artist that was kind of short lived. I am, I'm a really like determined, dedicated individual. Like if I have a goal, that's what we're doing. So you know how to cut people off, it seems like. It's not that I know how to cut people off. I just can understand if I have a certain discipline that you do not have and that I'm trying to hit a certain level that you are not ready for or that isn't your goal. Mm. And if we're headed in different places, then you should Bring head Bring the mic where a little closer, by the way. Yep, yep, absolutely. You, you should head where you're heading and I got to head where I'm heading. And I always try to do that in a, in a way that is uh, appropriate and, um, you know, not like I, I I'm really dedicated to the projects I work on you can ask any of the artists that I work with I am all in so when I realize somebody else isn't matching that energy for their own brand um, you know we just sometimes got to move in different directions so I went in different direction with that artist uh, and then I found an artist named Lou era um, actually technically Lou found me is that a boy or a girl name? That's a crazy name. Uh, it is a boy name. Okay. And he, I think, lives in Seattle, but I currently think he bartends. I don't think he does music anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I will stand by the fact that Lou has one of the best pens in all of Washington. Oh. So if anybody has heard any Lou era demos, they're going to know. Lou's pen is nasty. Mm. But, um, you shout know. Shout out Lou. Yeah, shout out <laughs> Lou, man, for real. Uh, we got to reconnect. Um, but, uh, you know, at the time, uh, this is like 2016, um, at the time I was again, just really, I, I have a goal of where I want to be. Um, and it is managing some of the biggest artists in the world. Um, I have a goal for this region and it's to bring, uh, infrastructure it's to bring a ma major publication, uh, a major publishing house, um, a major label, or at least a label with major label backing. You know, I think that we have so much talent up here, and there has been so many people before me that have laid down bricks and, and, and started paving the cement. And I think that, you know, it's, 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 I've always felt like it's my time to pick up the football and do everything that I can to or basketball or basketball <laughs> <laughs> to move the scene forward. And so, um, you know, I, uh, Lou and I just kind of had a different direction on pace and dedication. And, um, you know, uh, I find that a lot of artists are really driven for the art side of it, for the writing, the recording and the performances, which is super great. But that's like a basketball player being there for like the games and the tournaments and the three point contests. You know, you also got to show up to weights in the morning and you got to show up to film in the afternoon and you probably got to have a decent diet and you got to carry some, you know, level of, you know, certain discipline within your life. Um, and I just think at the time, you know, he had a lot of life things going on and it was uh, it was hard to manage and we were just kind of moving in separate directions and so um, Lou and I separated and uh, that was that was really hard that was probably the first time when I separated with an artist where like because being in a relationship with an artist as a manager is like being in the most dynamic relationship I could ever like explain it's like having a brother and a sister or two brothers you know it's like having a sibling but it's also like having a, a parent it to like you know a kid almost in ways but then it's also like having like a partner like not like a girlfriend boyfriend but mm -hmm. almost you know there's levels of like intimacy to it you're telling each other things that are are really personal you know and and so it's it's a really deep rooted relationship and so when you sometimes you have to pull that root out it it can hurt it can be really painful um, and so that, that was the first time I really experienced that when, when Lou and I went in different directions. Um, and then, uh, and then 
enters Django. Oh. Yeah. Uh, 2000 in December 2016, I believe. I'm sorry, Jang, if I'm getting that date wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we started working together and immediately I could just tell that uh, he is cut from the same cloth I am. He is going to do everything that it takes to be the greatest. He has that mama mentality you know if you will Mm -hmm. that michael jordan energy or if we want to bring it into music and stop using sports references you know (laughs) um you know whatever drives kendrick lamar or jay-z or anybody at the top to be at the top he carries that and i carry that and it's important to me that i instill people around me that carry that um, because, you know, we're trying to build a, a championship team. And uh, and so, yeah, we just immediately were a great fit. And uh, we put out a project and did some things that Spokane had never seen before. And yeah. uh, that was awesome. And then uh, <clears throat> fast forward and past that, I, uh, I started to want to expand to Seattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I come over. I meet Austin Santiago. Shout out, Austin. Um, he says something extremely profound to me one night in a club. I drove 10 hours. Well, just, that's a manager. Isn't Austin... Um, Austin is... Uh, I mean, he owns a label, but he also is a manager to Chong the Nomad um, and a few other uh, female acts, Lorelai in LA and... Sam, right? Uh, he consults with Sam. Got I don't it. know if that's official or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but they definitely have a business working relationship for sure. Um, and, you know, Austin lives in LA now, um, doing great things down there. But when he had lived in Seattle... Uh, used to put on these events with Red Bull and to me coming out of Spokane these things are like iconic I'm just like Red Bull's involved like that's major marketing you know backing like this is amazing what's going on so I come over to the show I drive you know if anybody doesn't know Spokane's like four and a half hours away from Seattle so very nice yeah so I drive about (laughs) 10 hours roughly uh, to come meet Austin Um, I briefly met him at a bar um, or at the bar Uh, we were at Chop Suey Mm-hmm. And I just kind of, I, I kept it really short, but I was like, hey, you know, my name's Riker. Uh, I come from Spokane. Uh, I'm an artist manager. I just wanted to, to meet you, give you my business card, um, and hopefully, like, we could we could have a conversation at a different time. I think what you're doing here is absolutely amazing, and I'd love to talk. Mm-hmm. Um, he took my business card, and that was it. And then, like, an hour later, he pulls up behind me at the bar and is like, hey, it's really interesting how you introduced yourself. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah? He's like, never really had somebody approach me like that. And I was like kind of taken back by what he was saying, right? Because at this time, I'm still pretty green, you know, like Jang and I had done our things in Spokane, but Seattle was a big city, and it was new. And, you know, like I said, I feel like I can talk to people, but it was a, it was a, it was a different space. Yeah. And uh, he was like, I've never really had somebody approach me and not, like, ask me for something and want something from me. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, no, I just wanted to, like, <laughs> meet you, you know, and, like, just come with that 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 clean slate, that clean energy. And um, so he asked me, he said, um, you know, what do you want to know? And I said, okay, you're right. I, I do have a question. I want to know <laughs> how how can I have my artist be a part of this scene? And he said something that has always stuck with me that is very profound to me. He said, how do you have your artist be a scene that you're not a part of? Mm. And it just made me realize that he was right. I had to invest into the scene if I wanted to be a part of the scene. If I wanted to jump over the scene and just do streaming numbers and like do the internet thing, I could have done that. But that wasn't the way we wanted to move. And we knew that from the very beginning. And so... Um, we went back home and from that moment on, we were in Seattle once every three months, once every three months became once every other month, which became once a month. And now is more like once to twice a week sometimes. And now you're on the NAS podcast. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's all the time, man. It's, uh, I feel like we're part of the community and it all started with, you know, just a conversation at Chop Suey one night and the inspiration to realize that we could be more than we were in that moment. But why do you want to be like part of the scene? Why don't you just do the internet router, just find some big artist to hop on, and then just help you and Django and whoever else you want to manage? To me, it's 
it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just popping an artist off and hitting billboard numbers or whatever. Like, I want to create a legacy. Shout out Django. Legacy, legacy, legacy. Legacy, legacy. Had to. <laughs> um, Everybody's blushing. Sh- shameless plug, <laughs> you know. Um, but no, for me, for real, I, I really... My father and the what he did in sports um, and who he is, and I'm intentionally not really putting his name out there because... I actually go by Riker. It's not my given name. Really? Intentionally. Can we, Can you tell me how you got your name then? That's a dope name. It was to create separation from um, my actual government name. God, are you like a Samantha or something? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Ugh, no. But the point was that like my parents have created like uh, something in the sports world. They've created legacy in that world. And, and Jacob. <laughs> my last name really goes uh goes down in in the sports uh history of, of this region but mm-hmm. not only this region but uh, kind of all over the country yeah and so i work in hip-hop mostly yeah. and i'm not trying to have something happen over here that's really going to taint what my parents have built over here so oh. i intentionally create a little bit of a wall okay so that we can we can live separate lives yeah um but yeah, I uh, I think that sounds like a stage name. Right? A little bit. It's like a stage name. But probably most people do. People even know you have another name. Uh, the people that have known me since I was young, yes. But most people know, which is good. Comment below what you think her name is. Wrong answers only. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I intentionally picked something that was uh, gender neutral. Do you like X Men or something? That's the only Riker I know. There's like a a villain he's like the mad sci- I think he's the mad scientist that gave Wolverine his claws uh, Riker. also on or is it Striker something Star no not Star Wars Star Trek there's a Riker on Star Trek okay um, are they an alien or are they a, I'm not a, he, I know Star Trek and I watch the newer movies but you'll never watch me catch in the fucking original my shit. brother used to watch it so I know a little but no I think they're a human okay um I uh <laughs> well Riker, it was it was a couple of things when I when I changed my name that I was really looking for. Yeah. One, it needed to be gender neutral. I have a certain approach to me where when I do business, my goal is to make it about business. But I also understand that a lot of other people want to make it about a lot of other things. So the gender neutralness of my name kind of disarms certain psychological barriers like that the resume have. thing exactly <laughs> exactly um Riker also means wealth and I think oh. that not that we're chasing wealth but that that will be a part of the journey yeah and I think that especially for black people um the idea that we shouldn't be millionaires is uh toxic in my opinion I think that there's a lot of people that talk about you know, you shouldn't be a millionaire. You shouldn't be a billionaire. When people get to that amount of money, we just talk down on them. We talk down on their decisions and what they're doing. And I think that there's a lot of lack of understanding. Like, if you've never had a million dollars, I doubt you can understand what it's like to have a million dollars. And so I think that for people of color, I want to inspire them and help them realize that, like, there should be no number in which you cannot have. Anything that you want, you can have. And... And that's girls and females and queer people as well. Like all of those those areas for me, it's important that women know they can be whatever job they want to be in this industry. Um, and and I try and embody that. And and that's really what Riker is all about. It's it's just embodying, being able to do something that others said we couldn't do. Yeah. Um, and so, the reason that I care about the scene, which was ultimately the question, is because I think that it's bigger than that. I think that me and my team just blowing up out of this area and leaving and doing something in L.A. or New York or whatever and nobody ever being able to follow through that footsteps and do it again is 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 a waste that that's a shame. So artists can't like leave and then come back. Is that not really? No, no. I think artists can leave. I do you think that's like do you think you can have the mindset of leaving and come back and give back to your community? Or is that kind of like a hard thing to to actually it's a nice dream to have, but do you think it's harder than it seems versus like making a structure here or wherever you're at, not even just Seattle? I think that what we really should get into is like, what's the goal? Like this is my, one of my biggest things with artists 
it's the first thing I ask when I, when anybody's like, oh, you know, you think about managing me or, or I have interest in an artist. It's like, look, what is your goal? Because if your goal is here and what I'm kind of like shooting for and what my team's direction for is here, we may not be a good fit. I think of management like I think of coaching. Like when you come out of high school, you got hundreds of colleges to choose from, right? In your decision making, you're going to choose which college is going to give you some of the biggest, uh, you know, eyes. Like uh, if you have D1 options and you can go to things like Duke or things that are going to have, you know, ESPN on them, then you might do that, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be a decision maker. Um, you might think about if it's going to be close to home or not. That might be a decision maker. But also who the coach is and how the program is ran is going to be a huge decision maker. Right. If it's football and you're a running back and it's a pass first offense, that might not be your fit. Right. Right. So it's like I run and or we run our team and our program in a very certain way. It's not going to fit all artists and all styles. So I, I try to look from that perspective. You know, that's 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 super important is is the right fit. Mm. Uh, and, and that's always w really where I, you know, had a separation with artists when an artist has gone into do something different or I've moved on to do something different. It's just coming back to that space of like, are we a good fit based off of what your goal is? So I think artists have to come with the idea of where they want to be, because I think, you know, wanting to tour and make seventy five thousand dollars a year is making a living wage off of music. But that's totally different than the person who wants to be the top of the billboard chart. Like what you have to do to go there versus what you got to do to go here. It's not the same thing. So you want artists that want to be on the billboard chart or like what's the... Personally, do you know who Scooter Braun is? I've heard of him, but I don't know much Scooter about Braun him. Scooter Braun manages uh, Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, and I could literally go on and on about... Damn. The, the number one roster like all top A celebrities um, but he built it from the ground with Justin didn't start that way um, he definitely uh, had a little bit of traditional training um, because he went uh, and worked with uh, uh, Jermaine Dupri okay. um, and they did a lot of stuff uh, back in the day and then there was a falling out in the office and Scooter went on to do his own things um, and he believed in the internet a lot earlier than the industry did and he kind of found Justin on YouTube um, and you can go watch the movie I don't have to tell this yeah. whole story but <laughs> the point is that um, Scooter was what I call my internet mentor wait do you think Scooter comes to Seattle because Justin has like is in Bellevue all the time I don't and his know. Out here. I think that with Scooter's roster, to be honest, I think he has to spend most times in LA. I'm not saying that he's never been here, but I don't think he gets to come here as often as we see Justin for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but yeah, I call Scooter my my internet mentor, um, and I learned a lot from him. Him and Dre London, uh, who manages Post Malone. Okay. Um, so you're really and, into and manager. Tiger background stuff a little bit that's absolutely cool. that's awesome absolutely and i from you know watching scooter and what he did and how he built that from the ground um it inspired me to understand you know that i can also do that yes he had some fast track elements yes he was connected to la reed and and he was able to make certain things transpire but i think that for me i want to be able to look back and make sure that there's a hundred artists that have a pathway to walk if they want to be you know a billboard charting artist or if they want to go to LA and, and start touring or if they want to if they want to get a label deal or if they want to be a songwriter let's like let's like stop even talking about being the face and the one holding the mic but I want people to realize the reason infrastructure needs to to happen the reason I'm so passionate is because I talk to these artists and almost every single one of them want to be the singer or the rapper or the person holding the mic. But when you go to LA or New York or Atlanta or any of these scenes, you realize that there is hundreds of jobs, hundreds of jobs. And so it's like, I don't want people to think that it's like, I got to be the rapper 
or I got to go work in another industry. Like you can have this industry and have your passion and work in this space. There just might be a better role for you somewhere. Can you explain some of those roles? Yeah, songwriting, even songwriting. I think that I talked to a few artists recently about like, you know, they're they're getting to a certain point where they're like, man, I don't know if this career, you know, trying to make a career out of music makes sense. And I'm like, man, your pen is amazing. Like your songwriting is amazing. Have you thought about trying to get a songwriting deal? Have you thought about trying to get a publishing deal? Have you thought about making money in a different facet? You know, there's a lot of people that are singers or songwriters producers, engineers, photographers, you know, they're doing all these things. Why don't you pick one or two to dial into? It's not that you can't have all the mediums. You can. You, you can be as creative as you want. But I think people got to remember when they start to want money from this, you're crossing into the industry side. And the industry side has to have some level of discipline, some level of focus, and some level of direction. You're just going to spin your wheels. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see that a lot in this region among artists, especially where they put out a single or a project, they support it for two weeks, they're silent for three months, and then they put out another single. Let's talk about, I don't know if this is the right phrasing. I've been working on phrasing a lot lately, and I'm terrible with it, so I always have to preface. Bella, what are your opinions on, like, fake advertisement like I see a big thing I've been seeing lately is like people will quickly screenshot oh shit I'm on the top iTunes chart and then within like 20 minutes they're not even like on the iTunes chart anymore right or like I think it's changed now because it became re- it's like really a common thing you see but like ca- cameos mm-hmm. like I used to see artists be like oh shit um whoever I don't I'm just going to use a random example so I'm not like targeting someone specific because I don't even think Drake has one. But let's say Drake has a cameo and it's like you're telling Drake, this is the number one album, you know? So Drake's like, yo, this is Drake. Check out Joe Blow's right. album. This is the t- t- shit. But they would like crop out the cameo tag. Mm-hmm. So people would be like, oh shit, Drake, you just got a gr- Drake co sign or whatever like that. Like, what are your opinions on like fake advertising like that? I am probably going to have a not popular opinion. Okay. It's almost all fake Mm. from top to bottom, the whole industry and how it's built it. There are so many fake elements to it. Fake though is a relative word. Mm. Marketing can come in multiple forms. Now I do think that artists that are moving in a certain direction have a standard line and certain types of marketing or creating certain perceptions like the cameo Drake stuff is below the standard line. But I still would say that an artist who doesn't know anything about marketing, who's just trying to emerge may think that is a good place to put their money in their marketing strategy. Right? So can I say fake? Mm, I don't know if I want to call them out like that. I would say it's more like you just chose odd marketing strategy elements and assets (laughs) yeah um but again that probably stems from not having a goal right which always why i come back to that it's like if you know where you want your project to be or where you want to be as an artist you can use that as a filter to like what you should be doing i think that what i love about marketing so much is that you know you got like sweetie with the mcdonald's deal right now right is that still going on uh I, th- I don't eat McDonald's, so I don't Me know. Me neither. That shit kills my stuff. I took a... I never was a huge McDonald's guy, but I decided to try a thing of, like, if I ate McDonald's and took a break and ate it again and see what would happen. So I oh. ate Mc- McDonald's, like, a year ago, and then I tried it again, like, a couple months ago, and, like, fucked up my stomach. I'm like, oh, Awful, shit. bro. No, Straight you can't poison. eat that. Absolute. But, you know, that's... I forget. I'm going to butcher this, but it's something like that's why soda was um, made for, like, um, fast food because of the acidity it like actually burns down the the processed food so that's what the point and of soda was at the beginning marketed it together yeah and you didn't know and you bought it and believed it it's like my whole point you're literally <laughs> making my whole point for me so like i just think that people got to understand that marketing is like a thing like when these guys are getting arrested sometimes and getting street cred and then their albums like some of that stuff is like all planned like some of these beefs are all planned 
Um, I was getting down to um, Megan the Stallion has uh, a hot sauce that she's doing right now with Popeyes. So you got Megan the Stallion with Popeyes, and you got Doja Cat with McDonald's. And because of the way these brands are built, and because they have a goal, they're able to see that this brand placement makes sense and is going to be a positive thing for the project and like put more attention on the artist, the brand, the music. And so therefore it goes up in, in, in chart placement. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's cause and effect. The idea is that you're doing things on the marketing side. That's going to move the song up, you know, whatever ladder you're trying to make it move. So I think when people are saying things like the iTunes chart, the reality is probably was on the iTunes chart for a second. And that's, that's awesome. Like you feel validated by that and that's exciting. And I think that even for a day, celebrate it. But the goal should be to keep it there for a week or a month or five months, you know, and, and trying to figure a strategy that's going to put it there. So instead of like seeing it as fake, I just think I see it as like, artists that are trying to create a marketing strategy that's going to help move their music they are just uneducated and unaware of how to properly build the strategy mm-hmm. you know so should everyone have different marketing strategies or is it like one way that's most likely going to work for most artists or i think that it i think that it depends on your goal with your project and the direction you're headed i think that there's definitely styles of strategies that can you know push you in certain directions but I also think every brand and every artist is different therefore every marketing strategy to some degree is going to be different like we have Kleenex and we have Puffs right oh yeah they're the same type of product sold on the same shelves packaged differently have different marketing different advertising and I would argue they probably slightly go for different demographics Mm. right so uber lyft color palettes are different ideas are the same but like uber's clearly going into food and helicopters and like this other side where lyft is shifting this way right and so it's like i think that when brands because ultimately all this is branding right when brands have a direction they're headed it's easier to understand the steps you should be taking. But when you're just waking up, being artistic, making a song, putting it in the world with no goal or destination, it's hard to have an idea of whether you got what you want out of it because you never knew what you wanted out of it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think then it leads to depression because people are looking at it like, oh, I didn't get these numbers. Well, it's like, what numbers were you even trying to hit? You know, and so like in our team, we are very specific about the goal because without it being super direct and specific, you don't know if you've hit it or not. Just saying I want to grow social media numbers is not specific. Well, if you grow 100, are you going to be satisfied? Well, you might not be when you look at your friend and see he grew 300 and now you've changed your goal because of what you're seeing from around you and and what else is going on in the scene instead of establishing the goal on the front end selecting it hitting it being satisfied and moving forward do you do you market Django and all day Trey completely differently or is it similar pretty differently you know Jang uh, we have this like exercise inside the team where um, 25 uh, we, we have them like get 20 actually I think it's 50 um, similar artists uh, so we have like a Google sheet and so they do like five that are like majors. So people that are going to be like the Kendricks, the Drakes, the, you know, the major majors. Um, then we do like 10, I think 10 or 15, like mid majors, um, which would be like the Denzel Curry's for like Django, right? The Rico Nasties, the, uh, IDK's, the Kenny Mason's. Um, and then we have like the local regional, um, emerging list Mm -hmm. and so when you look at like jang and trey's there is some crossover like tyler the creator but very little for the most part trey's a pansexual you know hip-hop artist that appeals to a lot of women um queer the queer community 
um, lots of women. And Jang has a more of an aggressive sound, so he appeals to like people that listen to rock a lot, um, people that listen to things like definitely women, but like the alt side of, of, of the woman demographic, the people that are going to go to the Rico Nasty shows and are going to go to those like uh, high energy mosh pit almost type energy. So uh, even like color palette, style, typography, I mean, that's all stemming from them but you can see like it just in like their catalog they're very very different Mm -hmm. very very different and how did you connect with trey and do you think it was do you think it was a thing where you picked him because he was a queer artist or no actually i've known trey for like i mean 2015 i think okay trey and i used to throw shows together Mm. and trey was an artist but he was also a show promoter and uh trey literally is one of the best networkers I've ever seen dude can get himself into any door any door he and so you know we used to bring like futuristic in and like um, at the time you know there were bigger names kind of emerging through and and there were shows that weren't happening in Spokane and um, and so yeah he we used to kind of run that scene together and he was an artist and always trying to figure it out and had managers and just and I was just a friend consulting that was just kind of like bro whenever you're ready to like stop doing it the way you're doing it and have a little bit of discipline and do it right like let's talk um, and so every other year me and my business partner Brayton we have a development uh, team a development group that we offer so we pick up anywhere between one to five artists uh, hand selected by us um, and we usually watch artists from about a year nine months to a year without so, reaching out to them or um, sometimes we have a relationship sometimes we don't it just depends um, and then you know right around the time the development group opens up we send offers out to the ones that we want to talk to and uh, we'll have like a meeting and uh, it's a non-contractual thing we agree to 18 months Uh, they pay us nothing it's completely on the house it's our way of like giving education back to our community Um, and we just help them put out a project uh, from start to finish Um, it's been a great program I love it Um, I think that what it does is it helps artists have an idea of what that next level kind of looks like and if this is actually what they want to do or not Um, and it also gives me repetition um, practice with different brands different artists different personalities different styles Um, and so Trey was on our 2019 development class is that right 2020 I lied. It was our 2020 (laughs) development class. That whole year thing has been crazy. Um, And him and uh, Harry, uh, or Harris Hills, um, he moved, uh, unfortunately. Uh, He's doing great things, though, down in, I think he's in Nashville, like right outside of Nashville. Nice. Um, Yeah, absolutely killing it. Um, Makes super cool music. Um, And, uh, yeah, Uh, so Trey did the project um was actually came out as pansexual in the last like year so i guess what i'm getting at is originally when i had taken trey on and when trey and i built our relationship that was like not a thing Got at it. least not a thing that any of us knew Got it. right so that was um that was something that i think that being around a queer manager and also i have another pansexual artist on the roster um i think that that comfort and that space of feeling like you're not the only one and that everybody in the space accepts everybody um allowed him to have the the ability to just kind of be himself Mm -hmm. um and so that's actually been kind of a newer development at least on the on the public side so uh yeah and can you break down uh we were talking about a few months ago like the difference between like partnerships and sponsorships oh um yeah like just like with outer brands like endorsements Mm -hmm. and stuff Um, yeah, I think that, um, well, I mean, you can have like different relationships with brands, so you can have like a sponsorship, um, and usually, um, on the sponsorship, like it's probably going to be like product, um, and, and just like a social shared, uh, cross marketing. Um, but with like endorsements, um, that's usually where you'll get like a check 
that's broken out to you. Um, and basically we were talking about just like how artists can have uh, better relationships or more relationships with brands through sponsorship and endorsement, right? And I think that a lot of that just comes from preparation. Again, I, I will repeat, going back <laughs> to the same things, like when you have a goal, then you kind of have an idea of where you're trying to take the music and you have an idea of the demographic that's going to listen to that music. Therefore, you know the other things in which that demographic is into and you're also into. And you can identify brands and reach out to them and just have an organic conversation, authentic conversation. Um, like vitamin water, for instance, right? <laughs> I Not only do I drink vitamin water all the time, it's like natural to me. It's not, I'm not forcing this. I love their vitamin water. That sounds so good right now, vitamin water. <laughs> right? And so on top of that, you know, I have a lot of photos. I bring it on podcasts. I just do things that are natural to me, but are also building um, my back catalog so that when I reach out to vitamin water and I'm like, hey, look at like these photos, look at this podcast, look at like this little dry commercial, you know, the sketch demo that we did for you. Like, yeah. just take a look at these things. We would love to have a relationship based off of this, this, and this, which for me, I could be like, you know, I travel a lot. I'm a manager of a roster. Uh, this gives me energy in the mornings, mm -hmm. you know, and now there's a whole um, narrative. And now the brand sees how it makes sense for them because to them, oh, okay, we're telling this up and coming story. We're supporting the young up and coming uh, energy, the, the, the new sound of an area. And so it's like, you can paint it. It's just marketing. It's just, yeah. you know, you're painting it in a certain way that makes sense for them, makes sense for you. You've done a little bit of legwork, so you now are have surpassed 80% of the people that tried to get into the door before you because they put no effort except for sending a message that was like, you should sponsor me. Yeah, you effort know? matters for sure. Effort matters. You can't, you can't approach people, especially in this industry, in marketing and entertainment, you can't approach people half-assed. I have a friend uh, right now that's reaching out for a label deal. He just got his, his project done. He has been on a label before, so he has a little bit of a background. And some of the things that, that they did, um, like individual messages, um, like videos that, that went along with their project, um, they sent to every executive that they're like trying to have a conversation with. Mm -hmm. And like the package was so specific and so intentional that I'm like, you're gonna walk away with a record deal. I'm just like, it's pretty obvious because you're gonna blow out all the competition because most people are just coming in with a CD, an ego, mm -hmm. and an expectation, yeah. you know? And there has to be a lot of, of effort. Um, I like to always, I always bring it back in my team and in, into sports and I say that like, you know, we can go right now to the basketball court at Green Lake. You're going to find a dude who probably shoots with the same shooting percentage as Steph Curry. Deadass. You'll find a three-point shooter out there that slays. But why is he in Green Lake and not playing in the NBA? Most likely choices, discipline, habits. Those things separate people. And I think that in entertainment, because of the way that it uh, it looks and it's projected, it's projected as like this big party. It's projected as like the diamonds and the jewels and the, you know, the women and the cars and the house and yeah. like the materialistic side is so projected that people don't actually showcase the hard work that comes with that. And when you watch the documentaries, you watch the movies, you realize these people are in dance class. They're in rehearsal hours, hours, hours to put stuff together. They got to go from rehearsal in front of the mirror, dance rehearsal, to rehearsal on the risers, to rehearsal in the sound, sta you know, sound stage. And, like, it's not easy. This isn't a cheat code or they don't even own the clothes and it's just like a sponsorship deal or a partnership or whatever right you know it's this isn't a i think people think entertainment's a cheat code and so they pick it because they think it's going to be easy all they got to do is like write some some dope songs and somebody's going to find them yeah that's why i think viralness is kind of stupid i was um watching one of my favorite podcasts the other day 
and um, I don't know why he decided to have this guy on, but he decided to have this um, guy, this uh, viral sensation on, who basically I had to turn off the podcast. I was like, this is stupid. This this guy had blown up for for whatever TikTok video and had gotten like over eight hundred thousand followers and had been in all these magazines and stuff. And he was complaining about, you know, once you reach a certain level, you just start going downhill. And I'm like, dude, it's because you weren't meant to be an entertainer. You just got success and you you were happy with all these likes and stuff you don't know what to do next absolutely absolutely again no goal right yeah and so it's like uh some of my friends you know this may sound awful hope it's not taken the wrong way but like <laughs> I, I don't want them to blow up oh not yet because in all reality i don't know if some of them would know what they would do with it and then now you're introducing all this attention all this money all this women all these drugs but with no plan no team no strategy what's your take on drugs do you say no to drugs <laughs> uh i like drugs that come from the ground naturally i think some people don't even classify like weed and stuff as drugs i would not i work in the industry and i definitely wouldn't consider it a drug but um yeah if it if it comes from like a natural source on this earth I'm less opposed yeah <laughs> let's just say that <laughs> it is weird how it can change people though not weed but like I've been noticing a lot of people like I'm realizing how many people actually are on medications or drugs and like you realize like a lot of the population is on and I also like I've been watching a lot of documentaries like the opioid ac- epidemic mm-hmm. and all that stuff and it's like it's wild how many people are on whether it's antidepressants or whatever, you know? It's wild to me that they convinced everybody that the stuff that grows naturally in the ground is a problem. Yeah. But the stuff they're making in the lab is the solution. <laughs> when a lot of what's in the lab is a, you know, souped up version of what came naturally from the ground. And the people that are doing the natural versions are going to jail. And the people that are getting it from the pharmacy are walking around. Do you think there should be a certain age, though, that you start, like, smoking or anything like that? Um, I grew up in Spokane, Washington, so my perspective of that is going to come from that idea. So I would say yes, but I also have cousins and friends and family that have come from, you know, California and Georgia and places where communities pick that stuff up a lot earlier you know Mm -hmm. and I never I never was in a community where I walk by the corner store and I'm just being subjected to like you know drink this smoke this you know got dealers on the corner and you know people cracked out around the corner like that just wasn't my existence right so it's like I I come from the perspective of you know, I, I think you probably should be getting to be 16 to 18 before you start dabbling into that type 16, of stuff. Jesus. But I feel like that's so early. I feel like teens shouldn't do that. But I don't know. I, don't, I Like, I have a lot of friends who do it, but I'm like, I wonder how that affects yeah, you. Yeah, but we're putting them on Adderall, like, at 10, you yeah. know? So it's like... Let's just say no to anything in your body till your your brain's done, right? Not saying... I don't know. I don't know. I think that there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of suicide at young ages, you know? And I think that... Um, I don't think weed is necessarily the answer, yeah. but I do think that we gotta, we gotta come up with something, you know? Um, I'm not advocating for underage smoking, you know, but I, I work in a medical state, um, right now in Oklahoma and I, there's a lot of patients, like a lot of patients that are under the age of 18 that are under the age of 21 mm-hmm. that get a lot of really good help from you know, doses of cannabis or Rixensum oil or just different things. And I think that people just have to understand that, like, it's dosing. Like, I may consume cannabis for recreational usage, right? We maybe shouldn't do that until we're, you know, yeah. hitting the 2021 marker. And that doesn't make you paranoid? Like, did you ever? Personally, no. Yeah, like maybe <laughs> when you first started? No. Nah, really? Not really. Yeah. So is that just like some people get paranoid and some don't, or like what do you, what are your what's your take on yeah, paranoia every, with weed? Everybody, <laughs> everybody comes from a different background, so everybody has something going on different inside them, and I think cannabis affects everybody differently. How but does we it have, affect you? 
we have natural cannabinoid systems inside of our body, so we naturally process cannabis. Oh yeah, there's like a part in your brain that is actually recep- receptive right. for it. Okay. So, um, my point was that I, I've seen cannabis help a lot of patients yeah. with the right dosage at all ages, and I think that if we remember it's a medicine and it can be used as such, um, it it really can help people. Um, but if we're talking about the recreational side of things, I definitely think people, you know, got to be a little bit older. Um, and and for me, it really, I have ADD, ADHD, something in that space. I think ADD is gone. I think it's just ADHD. Now. Right. I don't. That's why I said <laughs> I don't know what we're calling it today. Yeah. But, right. Um, so you know, cannabis really helps me feel um, grounded. Mm. Is the probably the best word to the earth. Yeah. Normal. You okay. know, I feel like I move at a similar speed as everybody else. Are things more funny when you're when you're high? I I don't think it affects me like that. I don't not anymore. I <laughs> guess not anymore. See, I you have a so tolerance. I, right? I, I work in the industry, so it's like I work in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a part. Here's of, my card. It's a part <laughs> of uh, it's a part of sampling and 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 knowing good product from okay. from bad product and. So I, I've definitely experienced my fair share of cannabis. <laughs> do you, do you think the industry is like a like an umbrella term? Like when do you know, as an artist at least, mm-hmm. how do you know if you're in the industry or not? Like that's, could you say Django's a, in the industry right that's now? That's a great basically? question. I would. I definitely would. Okay. Um, we're we're having conversations with, um, you know, some people out in LA, um, some publishing houses, um, some distro stuff. So it's like I, I definitely I would say that that we are. Um, but I think that's a really good question. I think that, I don't know. I think I'm going to say that that's, a, that's almost a, mm, that's tough. I, I almost want to say it's a personal decision on like whether you're making choices that are hobby-based choices or if you're making choices that are industry and career-based choices. But when I say that, I also think about all the people that walk around thinking like they're a rock star in the industry <laughs> and they're they're really not you know and so i think that it's a, it's there's a bit of longevity a little bit of effort a little bit of education like what direction are you headed you know the industry has an underground as well so it's like there's a lot of people that are in the industry but they're in the underground or a lot know? of the when i was in la um, a lot of those artists were saying a lot of people in the industry industry like come down to those underground shows and sometimes they sample some of those sounds you know so i assume that that probably happens in LA yes <laughs> people are inspired by things around them if you will <laughs> <laughs> I mean that uh that happens in the PNW you know mm-hmm. even in the way certain people dress and certain sounds that are made and I, I think that that's not always a negative thing you know like people are inspired by what they see and hear yeah. but I do think that you know when labels are intentionally you know going and like taking a sound from the street and kind of cutting off the opportunity for that person to to have a lane um i'd rather see the label just try and work with the artist that's making the lane but you know i I don't spend much time in la so it's hard to have too much of a perspective on on why they do what they do Mm -hmm. you know but um do we have an underground scene or we just a scene like how would you describe yeah pnw i guess not even i think that there's there's an underground scene for sure um, and I think that there's a scene. I just think they're both small and they're both developing and they're, they, sometimes they cross in ways that I think that people got to remember it's okay that there's two sides and that actually it's the healthiest to have two sides. Mm-hmm. Um, because that way people can move more freely and like connect with the people they need to connect with to, to get to kind of where they're going. So. What's the difference between like a SoundCloud rapper and a local artist, or a SoundCloud artist and local artist? Well, if the local artist is only putting their music on SoundCloud, then you tell me. <laughs> mm. So um, it probably comes down to doing shows, I'm guessing. Or I don't know. I I think that that stuff's like, in my opinion, that's the easy stuff. Mm. It's easy to show up for a show. It's just it's hard to not do the show drunk, right? Like it's it's easy to show up to the studio. It's hard to actually write 10 legitimately good songs that are less about your ego and more about doing what's best for the song, you know? Um, 
and you know music is an art form and art is very subjective and um is is, is a, its own artistic expression and emotional expression from somebody so to to grade that or rate that um comes with you know a bit of touchiness i think that all art has a demographic somewhere right so i don't know if there's bad art or bad music because i think that there is somebody somewhere that probably would like it right but if you're making this you know polarizing sound over here maybe only a hundred people in the whole country are gonna like it so it's like you will have a fan base but you'll have a fan base of a hundred people which means touring might not be an option and you know finding other artists to work with might be hard and um you know so it's like i think artists have to understand that there, there's lanes of sounds and you definitely want to be unique you definitely want to make your own authentic, unique sound. But if you can't elevate or pitch what you're making, then you're going to struggle in the industry. You have to be able to go into an elevator, you know, Jang, whoever, uh, Trey, has to be able to go into an elevator and be like, yeah, you know, I, I make my own sound, but I'm kind of like hip hop, met metal, and had a baby. Like a little bit of Denzel Curry, Rico Nasty, but with Kendrick Lamar, lyrical you know depth i can say that in like 10 seconds yeah you know if you can't concise it down and like be direct about you know who you are i think a lot of artists are afraid to say i sound a little bit like this and this and they want to be like, i don't sound like anybody oh i see actually i see that a lot with bands i feel like bands are because i've been having bands on lately they're more open to saying they get inspiration or sound like this band but with like pop artist or um, hip hop artist, I feel like they're less to say they sound like someone else. I think it's the history of the culture behind it. And I think that, you know, hip hop especially is like a lot of times it's somebody like really laying out their life experiences. So they don't want to feel like they sound like anybody else because they're their own unique individual. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's where a local or a regional emerging artist is missing what the industry is trying to get from that question. We're trying to understand who you are and what type of music you make in a very quick communication. So if you can't say, I'm a little bit of this with a little bit of this with this, you know, spice on top, you're telling me you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So you saying, oh, I sound, you know, I sound like I don't sound like anybody. I'm 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 my own artist. All you're doing is you don't realize it, but you're mostly just raving a red flag of like, I'm not there yet to the place where I can tell you my sound or my sounds all over the place, and mm. I haven't defined my sound yet. Right? It's like in marketing. If I'm like, hey, who's your demographic? And you say everybody, <laughs> all you're telling me is that you don't know who your demographic is and you don't know who you're appealing to and you don't know who your buying market is. Right. I'm never going to believe it's everybody because it's not everybody. Nothing <laughs> is everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I think that people got to understand there's a language to the industry. Um, I'm actually free tip. There's a book. All you need to know about the music business. Is everything the, is you need to know about the music business. Hold on. Oh. This is important. We gotta do this. Yeah. Free knowledge. This is free a knowledge, knowledge podcast. I don't know if it's a knowledge. I guess it's a it's a my demographic everybody is everybody. And um I don't have a sound because I'm my own podcast. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, I got it. Um, it's called All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Daniel or er, Donald S. Passman. I don't trust people named Donald. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's a lawyer, and oh. uh, it's like the 10th edition. They make a new edition every, like, four or five years. Oh, shit, like Webster's. And they update it with uh, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, and it's, like, a lot of verbiage, how deals work, why deals work the way they work, how to build a team, who you need in your team, who should come first, what percentages you should probably be paying them. Like it's really vital for artists to have a baseline education so that they don't get taken advantage of. A lot of people say that, you know, industry's ruthless. It is ruthless. Yeah. It's definitely cutthroat. But most artists are walking around with no education. 
and then they're mad when they get taken advantage of. Can you repeat the title? That's actually, I think I want to read that too. Absolutely. Yeah. It is called All You Need to Know About the Music Business, Donald S. Passman. And the 10th edition is a yellow book with red writing on it. Uh, get the most updated edition. That way, everything you're learning is from the most updated. <laughs> you're context. reading from like the 70s. <laughs> 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 um, since we're giving free book knowledge out, I actually want to give one more if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Green Eggs and Ham is a good one too. It inspired me to start the podcast, actually. Oh, that's so <laughs> funny. Or wow. red fish, blue fish, green fish, yellow fish. Orange fish is my second favorite. Or <laughs> Hop on Pop. I'm really into oh, Dr. Seuss. App. Couldn't even find my Audible app. Oh, you use Audible, huh? <sighs> oh, shit. Seattle, Have you don't go crazy on me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read um, or listened to Charlemagne the God's book? Oh, it's on my list, but not yet. It's actually, oh my God, it's something like like 20 hours or something. And it's actually more of a podcast than a book. It's like he's interviewing different black people with different backgrounds that are successful in their industry it's really interesting but i anyone who wants to listen to it i've actually had to pause it a few times because it gets very biased at times Mm. but it's worth a a listen if you're down for a if you're going on a road trip i'm it might be like 30 hours it's a long ass thing but it's it's very interesting and like i love charlamagne the god so that's fun yeah. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to pick it up. And it's free on Audible. If you have Audible. That's right. Yeah, I have it in my Hell yeah. queue. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> the other book, this is for all the the uh upcoming managers, people that inspire to be a manager or managers that just haven't read it. Um it's called Artist Management for the Music Business by Paul Allen, not our Paul Allen, <laughs> different Paul Allen. Rest um, in peace. Yeah, RIP. He was a real one. Yeah. Um get the 4th edition. It's blue dark blue hell yeah yeah so what do you what do you do i don't really know how to phrase this <laughs> but what if you're an artist mm-hmm. and you have all the goals and all the marketing set up mm-hmm. and you're still just not seeing any success like what do you do with that like is, is there a certain age or timeline where you have to kind of just pump your brakes or i mean it we all know that music is definitely a younger person's game i definitely don't think that age should deter people from trying to make it in the music industry it does appeal though to the youth that's just a fact um i think that at certain phases sometimes people need to look at the cards in their hands and see if maybe being a producer like we were saying earlier or maybe being a songwriter or maybe going working at a label and being an a and r um, might be a better fit for them at a certain age and time. Um, th- yes, I think people should consider um, other opportunities. But no, I think that at any point in time, um, you know, you could you could really break through um, if you're passionate and you're really doing the things that you need to be doing and you're making the right steps. But I also think sometimes. It's hard to say, you know, this is just, I'm coming from the business, the side of it. And I know that, you know, when people are making art, it's a very personal thing. But sometimes people want a different sound from an artist, right? Like maybe there's a a rapper, right? And they don't feel like the music's coming from an authentic place. Maybe they don't feel like that's the life that person actually lives. I'm using this as an example because up in here in the PNW, I see this a lot. Um, you know, in my city, you know, for a long time, we only had one or two black hip hop artists in the whole scene. And I'm not saying that, you know, people that aren't black can't have an experience that um, allows them a space to, to write rap and to write from, from that experience and, and to give songs about, you know, maybe living hard upbringings, like that's not, uh, that's not defined by race. You know, everybody can have a hard upbringing, but I think it was interesting because I don't think everybody that was rapping at that time 
was coming from an authentic place. And I think some people just wanted to be a rapper. They wanted to wear chains. They wanted to look cool. They wanted to emulate black culture. And in a place that doesn't have a lot of black people, there's nobody really checking them. Mm. So there's nobody checking what they say, what they look like, um, how they come off. And so they feel like they can just run this persona. And um, I think that when I watch some of those brands not stick, or people not want to buy the music or the 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 merchandise or the art or whatever. It's because I think that that artist really is, is coming from a place of, of ego and less of authenticity. Mm. Um, and I think that when artists truly come from a place of authenticity, um, that is felt by the audience and that is that is heard. And so I do think sometimes artists are moving into a sound or into a style because their friends are or because they feel like they need to to be cool instead of making what naturally comes from them um i sat in the studio with nobi last night yeah and you know not to not to give too much on what's to come but i was blown away by the music that i was listening to it was very different um in 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 certain ways from what i've heard in the past but it was phenomenal and i i told him i was like man i really love you know what you used to do here but i can't deny that like where you're headed is it's just so good and i'm interested to see how this next project or projects or however he chooses to play it resonates with the audience because i truly think he's starting to find that sound and find his niche yeah. um and and it's a little bit different from what we've seen before but i, I think it's actually going to be accepted really really well that's exciting. I love yeah. Novi. Yeah, me too. He's he's amazing. Very talented. Mm-hmm. So, how do you how do I phrase this one? Do you ever worry that everything you want to accomplish won't happen in your lifetime? And like, do you ever think about if you're just going to be a building block for others, or and and if you if that is ever a worry or something you think about, how do you maybe prevent that from happening? I'm really big in like manifestation so I think what we think about and what we talk about comes to life so if you ever have a conversation with me about where my my career is going and where my brand is going where my artists are going um, you're never gonna hear hesitation in that you're never gonna hear oh like you know we might make it and and if we do that'd be really cool like (laughs) I speak from fully 100 1000 belief that we are going where we said we're gonna go. And if I wake up one day and we didn't make it, then I gotta deal with that at that moment in time. But when I look for how we started to where we are, you're gonna have a hard time telling me we ain't going <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Hell yeah. You know, and I think that what I what we've built, people are now walking on today. And so I also I am here to be that building block. I am here to be the first person to do certain things from my scene or from, you know, the upper left scene. Um, I am here to break new walls and new barriers, and that's okay. Austin broke walls before me. Melly broke walls before him, you know. Um, Rachel Floatard broke walls before all of us. Like, there are so many people that, that broke walls you know, and, and we could go into artists, we could talk about, you know, Macklemore, and I know some people aren't a huge fan, but I am a huge fan because I recognize that he did something that hadn't been done before him, and now people walk around with the idea that that's possible, mm-hmm. and just that alone is magical. So I think that I want to show people what's possible, and if I don't reach my goal, I at least showed them something they've never seen before. And the maybe the person behind me comes up with a better way to do it, and they go even farther. And man, that would that would make me more than happy. And mm-hmm. that's why I spend so much energy focused on how the upper left is going to move, how the P and W is going to move, how Washington is going to move from here, and then the next twenty years from now, and not just my artists, because this isn't just about us. This is about our whole scene getting our art heard by people past the barrier walls of these mountains and how do you keep yourself and your team in check like how do you know you're on the right track and how do you make sure you're not like 
being lazy with something or well um my company is owned by a couple different people me and my brayton dawson is my business partner he handles a lot of like um he's the business manager so he handles a lot of like the financial uh spreadsheets making sure things are like staying on track he also uh owned a uh, marketing agency before we got together and so he has a deep rooted understanding of like social marketing and just marketing in general and advertising um and so i come from rewind household <laughs> of courts you know and so the 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 coaching background is instilled in me so the keeping the discipline in the team is like second nature to me it's like having a sports team and to some degree and just making sure that all the players are staying on their trajected paths their individual paths and making sure that they're reaching the goals that you know they're headed so it's a uh, it's definitely something we got to put effort into every single day it's not easy but I don't feel like I work a day in my life mm -hmm. I love what I do and it is very difficult I get very little sleep I travel all the time um, I'm driving through the night back and forth Spokane to Seattle like <laughs> weekly um, and you know I have to say all that because I think that people got to remember my mentor taught me something um, Scooter Bronson <laughs> no I wish <laughs> I wish uh, we're gonna meet someday Scooter though for real <laughs> just gonna sit and have some tea I'm speaking that into existence well, what type of tea you have to make this you have to make sure this is completely manifested so you have to think uh, of I'm the specific having chamomile tea. okay I don't know what type of tea he drinks but I bet you he's like a Earl Grey okay is there gonna be any Biscoff with this or uh no nah, I think we're just gonna have tea keep it real simple okay like early meeting vibes you know a little cafe yeah yeah it'll be cool maybe a kitty cafe I went to my first cat cafe <laughs> it was very interesting I had this one cat that loved me more than anyone else in there that's but awesome. I don't know if I ha want a cat. Cats like me more than dogs, though, which is interesting. Yeah? Yeah. I like small cats, though. I think I think dogs. I'm more into dogs. I have a cat, though, that's super dope. His name's Bic. Bic? Yeah. Like the shaving company? No, it stands for Black is King. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You know, he's a black cat. But, wow. like, also double entendre Bic lighter. You yeah. Know? Are you, you going to get sponsored by Bic one day? Uh, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I do. Uh, I do always. Everybody knows, right? Riker. Oh shit! Always carries a big front right. That's hilarious. Front right pocket. Oh my god. So, do you have any? We've talked about advice for artists. Do you have any specific advice for managers? Um, don't be hard on yourself. Um, take it one step at a time. Perfection's not coming overnight. Um, don't compare yourself to anybody that has a nine to five. Mm. That's the number one. Actually, erase everything else I said. Don't compare yourself to anybody that has a nine to five. Cause I went through a period of depression cause my friends are getting up at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning and they just have a certain schedule to their life. And I'm getting up at, you know, nine, 10, sometimes even 11. And I'm just like, am I being lazy or whatever? But I'm also realizing they go to bed at eight, 9 PM. I'm still at a show. Yeah. I don't get back from the concert till midnight. I'm up doing emails till 3 a.m. You know, sometimes that's when I get my workout in. So I go to bed somewhere between like 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. Jesus. On a regular basis. I'm I'm an old man, or I don't know if it's an old man or a young kid, but I go to sleep at like 9. See? <laughs> and so it's like I had to I had to just recognize that like I can't compare myself to people that don't live my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's hard because there's not very many people in this region that live my lifestyle. So I didn't have a reference point a lot of the time. It's kind of running in the dark. Yeah. Um, running through the six, maybe? <laughs> running through the nine. You oh, know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Running through the nine. Do you ever get, and if you do, how do you deal with like pushback from people and being like, oh, you're not living in Seattle? Maybe you need to move to Seattle to get everything done. Yeah, there is definitely some people with that perspective, but I think it's hard to say that when I probably put more hours in than most people, and I, I'm i in Seattle so much people think I live here. Damn. Like, I'm here, I'm literally, I got in last night, it's, uh, it's Thursday, yesterday, it's Friday today, I leave tomorrow, Saturday, and I will be back in Seattle on Wednesday of next week. Mm-hmm. So four days, 
and I was maybe just here uh, Wednesday of last week. Sounds like you need like a, a partnership with an airline or something so you could just fly in and out. Uh, to be honest, I really like to drive. Oh, maybe you're just claustrophobic. Are you claustrophobic? I feel like you're going to be like, I don't like No, airplanes. no, no, it's not that. It's that when I get on the ground, uh, I need to be able to move pretty regularly. Like, um, I'm a runner a lot of times. I'm picking this up over here. I'm grabbing this artist there. We got to go get clothes here. And so it's just like, it's hard to not have a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a corporate account with uh, Thrifty which is great. Shout out Thrifty. Shout out Thrifty. Uh, they've been supportive from the very beginning um, and really put us in a great position uh, to be able to move about. Um, so, yeah. Hell yeah. Do you have anything else you want to cover for artists or managers or um, people? I, I think just the entertainment industry is not for everybody. I think people need to be realistic whether they like to make art because it's a hobby that they enjoy or whether they want to make a career out of making art. And I think that that's super important to kind of nail down. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that um, build your team intelligently. Start with a lawyer or start with a manager. One of those two is gonna be able to help you build the rest of your team. So don't start with trying to find a label or start with you know, a booking agent. You know, It's really important. Get your education down. Um, both artists and managers this is a whole industry you got to be able to speak the language so get your education down pick a plan pick a strategy move in that direction have healthy habits recognize that this is a career and if you want to compete at the top level like any professional have discipline with your habits um, and have discipline with you know the way that you move the what you consume and um, remember that people pay money to see you and you can't be falling off stages drunk. <laughs> you know, managers got to check your artists and artists, you got to check yourselves, you know. Um, and past that, diversity and inclusion is, is always key. Yeah. We cannot have arts and culture without diversity and inclusion. And I think that women need to be empowered continuously. They not only should be the model, they should not only be the backing vocals, but they need to be the manager or the producer or the director, you know? We need to keep making room for women. When you're building your lineups, find a female artist, add her to the bill. Um, queer as well, queer artists, um, diversify. It's, it's important for the scene. So I think that those are like my, my quick run-throughs, you know? You, we, gotta, we gotta move as one uh, if you win. I win, if I win, you win. And if we can keep that mentality and recognize that, like, just because this person got a deal, just because McIntosh got a deal or Travis got a deal, doesn't mean that Django doesn't have an opportunity anymore. If anything, Django has a better opportunity to get a deal because now people are considering our region. Mm -hmm. So just remember the success of others is the success of yourself. Hell yeah. Black power. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Upper left, baby. <laughs> there we go. This is the NAS podcast with... This is Riker. And we did it. <laughs>